Who are you? Uh, my name is Seth Chismore. I'm Principal Architect with Max Media, um, a full-service interactive agency here in Atlanta, Georgia. Very cool. Yeah. And who are you? So I'm John Willis. Um, I'm VP of Services for a company called Ops Code. Um, some people know me by my wacky handle called Bachigaloop on Twitter, but uh, I think most people, more people know me from that handle than, than others. But Ops Code, yeah, recently started. Where, where do you get the handle? <laughs> since you oh, mentioned. yes. So uh, it's a song my mom used to sing to me when I was a kid. There's actually no definition for this word. Very cool. So, so I guys, own Bachigaloop. You guys aren't in the same company? or uh, Tell yeah. me why we're all okay. having yeah. a conversation here. Well, I guess I'm sort of like, a, I work with both Ra the Rackspace Cloud and Ops Code. So yeah. we recently moved, vacated a co-located hosting, moved everything into the cloud. Uh, so we use Rackspace Cloud as our actual host. And then we use uh, the Ops Code platform, which is Chef. To actually manage all those servers. Yeah. So it helps us sort of wrangle this large infrastructure we're building. So very cool. Yeah. And what do you do? So, you so yeah. Up? So well. So I, I've code. recently come on as a VP of services, but um, it's kind of a small company, so I've got a lot of different roles. So one of the things that um, I've been trying to find our customers, and it just happened to be that Seth was given a presentation at a Ruby Group last week. And uh, so we hooked up and I, I told he showed me what he was doing and it was a great presentation about why somebody want to use our product. You know, the, this idea of infrastructure as code or abstracting your infrastructure such that you don't really touch or you don't have to be a sysadmin per se. Yeah. You can write code that executes what a sysadmin can do. And it, it's really a fascinating story. And his, it was interesting. People had come up to me after and say, "Well, you must have paid him for that." I'm like, "No, no, I, that was his presentation." Yeah. You know? so, yeah. So. I mean, for us, it's really allowed us to scale a small team. I mean, usually you think about scaling on the terms of scaling your server, scaling, you know, scaling out to handle load. But for us, we've also been able to scale our team. You know, we've got about a team yeah. of eight for our technology team. Yeah. And that's split between developers, sysadmins, and you know, architects. And right. We're able to actually service multiple Fortune 500 customers. I mean, one of our customers' products we're on now is a 40,000 person company, multinational, and they're actually choosing us to host their stuff over their in house you know, hosting team just because of the service we can offer them and at the price. So, so tell me what's going on here because I, I love seeing disruptions yeah. like this. What, what is the disruption that has happened that lets you exist? I mean, the big disruption. You shouldn't exist, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, like I said, we were more traditionally just your traditional interactive agency doing uh, user user design, uh, information architecture, and a little development. But we've actually yeah. moved and taken our hosting, which was originally a cost center for us, and it's become something that's profitable. And we're so you used to have a data center, or tell, tell yeah, me we what used you to have did. about three or four large servers in a co-located hosting. It was more of a vertical scaled thing. We had a lot of clients on these couple servers. And now we're actually building custom stacks for our customer. A lot more servers, they're a lot smaller, but they're also doing more specialized job and working better. And each of our customers is completely isolated from each other. So we're able to offer more of what you're used to with an enterprise solution with uh, service level agreements, you know, uptime guarantees. We can do that because it's their stack. We know what's going on there. We understand it intimately. Whereas before, a lot of customers on you know, one server, it's a little more difficult to guarantee some of that stuff. And, and so, what kinds of stuff are you doing on these little um, servers? We actually use, for, for a lot of our customers, a lot of it's Ruby, uh, MongoDB, a lot of, you know, NoSQL databases, newer stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, Solar for indexing, you know. So it's traditional web app stack, but we've got a few things mixed in there, and it's all set up in a very high availability way. So there's no single point of failure. Things automatically fail over, uh, taking advantage of some of the rack space, virtual IPs and stuff, so. It's so really you're cool a stuff. you're a customer of his, yeah, yeah. and you're a customer of Rackspace. Well, we're working with Rackspace. Okay. We have yeah. so I was describing this a little bit last night. So one of the things a lot of people don't get about the cloud is they think the cloud is like pixie dust, right? Yeah. So and and I was trying to describe the cloud as three pieces. Simple way for me is that you have the infrastructure, which yeah. is the data center, which he just moved over to Rackspace Cloud, right? Or others moved to Amazon or whatever, right? So and then you have your apps, right? Which we haven't figured out how to snap that. And then what most people don't realize is there's a really expensive piece, which is how do you build the infrastructure around your app? How do you build load-bound, scalable, things that can use the infrastructure or 
um, cash systems that feed into that or like he's using a lot of analytics we see this in our customers those become complex infrastructures to bring people in and so that's a very expensive piece so when you get the cloud you get to a point you think okay I've got my 10 servers now what are you doing well what you have to do with them even when they're a cloud is go hire sys admins yeah and there's now you're basically back to bare metal one-on-one and so what we do at chef again is we abstract that so that we have already in place a cookbook for something like Hadoop or something like a, a, an analytics tool like Solar. And then, or we make it really easy for somebody like Seth to, well, I say easy, but I know it, it takes a little bit of work but, um, to get it started. But he can abstract that. And yeah. I think you know, Seth will point this out that, that you know, once he's got that kind of cookie cutter first one, then as new businesses come in, he, all he has to do is take that kind of cookbook abstraction. It's right. reusable code at that point. And that's structure. As tell me what you used to have to do before yeah. this Mean. new system. You yeah, know, when a new customer walked in the door and said, "I want sort of sort of something similar to yeah. what you've done." You I mean, know. we would basically have to go out to one of our servers because we weren't going to be able to buy another server. We couldn't, you know, even if it's a small server, it's still expensive to have, you know, for us to manage. So we couldn't just go buy a new server and start from scratch. We'd have to work it in the existing server, sort of wedge them between some other customers, hope that the machine was going to hold, maybe buy some more memory for that machine. But it was really hard for us to do individual load testing for each of the customers. All these things you'd want to do because you know, in the middle of those load tests, we might bring a customer down and other customers. So, you know, now since everybody's isolated, we can sort of operate on their little bit of infrastructure, completely separate, do everything we need to do, load testing, you know, tweak things as we're going into to production and that kind of stuff. So yeah. it's been, like I said, it's just been a huge win because, you know, this is the stuff, you know, I used, we used to work at IBM and we used to do this type of stuff, obviously for IBM level customers or size customers. And I can sort of apply the things I learned there in the smaller company and still offer that enterprise, you know, s scale uh, service to a customer, which is just awesome. It also lets you turn around a lot faster because yeah. you're not having to, to Order mess hard. with the machines exactly. and up update RAM or anything like that. Exactly, I can scale them. I go to a web panel or use click, the API click, click. and yep, just scale it up when we need to. Yeah, and, yeah. Right. You know, and the point is you can scale both the infrastructure, mm -hmm. which is the cloud, but you can scale also the sysadmins. Like, so one of the things I find when I talk to a lot of my customers is that you know, today they might like he might have two or three sysadmins, or depending on the size of the company, they're spending eighty percent of their time working on things that really add no value to the company. Right. But they usually are they're hired with yeah. skills like you say you'd like to have hire a developer that make them a sysadmin. Yeah. Then try to make a sysadmin a developer. So if your company has a lot of developers and they're spending eighty percent of time on just muck of infrastructure, you know what I like to say is I'll flip that. I'll get those guys spending 20% of their time on infrastructure and 80% on the value add why you brought them in the door. At the end of the day, if you're Max Media, you want everybody in Max Media to be able to put a high percentage of your time into Max Media's business, yeah. not yeah. into the plumbing. Yeah, and I mean, wow. for us, it's like in a small company, we all work for small companies, we have to wear many hats. So yeah. I can find guys that can do a little everything and I can teach them the system administration they need to do to you know, help us manage our servers. And, Stuff like that, so it's it's been a real win for a small company, you know, to yeah. finally compete sort of with the big the big dogs. I mean, you know, it's yeah. been it's been great. So. Now, before the camera started, you said you were going to take this methodology to enterprises. Well, yeah, and so the enterprises don't like to try new things, right? Well, <laughs> some do and some don't, right? Yeah. I mean, we're seeing companies that are enterprises now that didn't exist five years ago, right? That's right. So YouTube didn't exist right, five right. years, and ago. you know, or Shopzilla, or you know, I mean, these are companies that that are now enterprise class data centers. And again, I think there's gonna become a point where the exposure of how do you run, I always make this joke when the mad money guy starts screaming, when we, he can actually start yelling at companies like, look how much money you're spending on infrastructure and look how much your competitor is, you know, right? That, that's when they're gonna get the kick in the boot, right? You know, they're gonna get, but they have the same problem. I talked to a guy, large freight company, enterprise fortune 1000 company, and he's doing the sysadmin work for like monitoring, which, you know, as you scale up, right, the jobs get, you know, the server guys, you have capacity planning, you have monitoring guys. Well, this guy's a monitoring guy. And he was asking me about open source. He's like, John, you know, I know you've been fooling with open source. And he's a big IBM customer. And I said, well, you know, I said, I think there's some viable ones. And I gave him my kind of usual suspects. And, and so then he went, well, you know, management in this open source. I'm like, you know, time out. Enough of this open source versus non open source. I said, my guess is that you spend 60% of your time daily working on making those products work and 40% of your time trying to, to add value to the company. And he said, you're wrong. I said, oh really? He said, it's 80% of my time wasted 
on making these products work. And I'm like, that's the argument you have to make to your organization. Yeah. It's, it's not a question of try this, try that. It's, there are responsibilities in an organization that just need to be clear. And, and yeah. I, so, so I think you know, I think the enterprise there are enterprises that won't change their ways, and there there there'll be new blood, new CIOs, new CTOs that will come in and and just see what their competition is doing. Tell me about your business a little bit more. Sure. It, so we are an open source company. So yeah. we have, uh, basically we have um, an open source framework, which we call Chef, right? And it's yeah. basically a REST-based API for doing, uh, it's a framework for doing configuration management. So okay. all we talked about, abstracting the infrastructure. And we have two ways that you can run that client, if you will. You can run it as an open source server that you can install in your own infrastructure. Yeah. and. Um, and we support that. In fact, we use that open source server as the input to our platform. And the place yep. where we make money is on our platform. Yeah. So we run a, a platform as a service. And the interesting thing is, um, you know, make a little plug is our CEO is Jesse Robbins. Yeah. Right. Who who ran you know basically availability for all very the pop very famous in for the database. Yeah, Amazon. Like and then he brought in a guy called Chris Brown who wrote EC2. And so he's the guy who who architected our platform as a service. So big guys. It, it's, we got big guns. You know? What did Jesse do again? I think I spoke over. He you. he basically ran the availability. He owned availability for basically all the commercial properties in Amazon. What's interesting that's going on is this kind of concept of DevOps, and it, I think it comes out of the velocity idea that you look at these companies at the the O'Reilly Conference Velocity, right? And, yeah. and I've heard the term used, Internet Ten, right? These companies that are just the Flickers, the Twitters. And, and the way they're treating their infrastructure is breaking down this wall, and like they never had a wall. In the enterprise, you go to the large Fortune 1000s, there's dev and there's operations, and yeah. it's a brick wall, and it's always been a battle, right? The developers throw it over the wall, the operations guy complain that they, they don't know how to monitor it, these guys complain that, on the other side, that you guys do a horrible job operating this stuff, and it, it's just always a dog and cat fight. I mean, it's. And so there's this kind of idea emerging of DevOps, like we're kind of work together. And if you look at the Flickers and the Twitters, what they're doing is instead of trying to do the over the wall configuration management, it's back to this like defining everything that you're gonna configure as an abstract layer of code. Check that into the same repository that you have your apps in. Right, so it's now one common, you're a common goal, you're a common team. As you follow agile methodologies, like you know, from requirement all the way to dev, test, production, you are, you're not just doing half the silo. Right? It, the whole thing is integrated, you're one team. And I think that's, fundamentally, that's what's changed. The people who are tuned in, the companies, and if you talk to like the shop sellers and the, these guys, they're tuned into that concept of, and along with continuous integration, and, yeah. right? They're tuned yeah. into this idea that it, it's one flow and it's not a, a wall and a group. And, and I think the thing that changes it is software like ours and, you know, and there are some other open source products like that, that that have really allowed you to fully treat the infrastructure configuration stack as code which now it becomes, you know, it, yeah. it, it's all code. Eric, Eric Rees is even going further. He, he, he wants you to check in code 60 times a day. Oh yeah. Like, well, total, yeah. like you, you break down a project in a little micro bits mm -hmm. that you perform and you check in, you know, and you just keep iterating, keep yeah. iterating, iterating. That's quite different than like, you know, it's like I worked at Microsoft and you didn't do that. Yeah. You know? Well, <laughs> you know, first it was agile development, right? And yeah. so the, what's, what's come out of this is the term I love, agile operations. You know, in, in this this idea that you know, we're, there's agile test, agile development, agile operations, yeah. and you know, we work together, and, and yeah, so and they support the ultimate goal, yeah. the business goal. So you've got the this small server stack that does one thing, support the application that's going to run, and those two support the overall business. I mean, yeah. that's whereas in the past it's like, you know, this huge server would be running all kinds of different apps, they're all doing different business pro different things, and you'd worry about, well, is this one going to step on that? And that's why the operations guys had to be so like hardcore and control it all, but now that yeah. the operations team is part of the development team, we're like really a technology team, and we deliver this thin stack that does the one thing it needs to do and does it well. It's tuned yeah. just to do this application, just to serve this app up in a very scalable way. And I mean, that's a completely different way of thinking. And the, the cloud side, the Rackspace cloud, like stuff like that, yeah. like the virtualized servers have made that possible right. because servers are cheap. Yeah. We can bring up instances and we just scale the ones we need to and I mean that's a completely different way. Somebody, somebody predicted, and I forget who it was, that developers would, uh, um, b because you're putting your credit card into Rackspace Cloud or Amazon, 
and you knew the impact of your code that you would actually get you know get raises or, char or charged based. back ah. based on how much compute cycles <laughs> that, your that, code that, took. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, depending on how much resource cycle CPU cycles you take, that determines your bonus, I guess. Right? Yeah. Right. Write better code, obviously. Right, right. And get taste. a bonus, right? You know, because <laughs> if you're taking less money out of the company because yeah. of your cost of your compute cycles, you know. So one of the things I did actually for the previous like year two years I started blogging right and, and I had my little niche of cloud this kind of cloud arati and I'm kind of scobelish in this yeah. little tiny cloud cloud arati but not nothing near your fame and fortune but but the but the thing is is that with the the, the cloud and it I just described it the reason why you see a lot of enterprises now going out to to rack space and, yeah. and and I was to try to tell people the reason why they're doing it and I was like well it's a cloud no that's not the reason well it's cool no it's because they don't have to deal with a human yeah. to get the resource. Exactly. Right. It's it's they've completely eliminated the, the in the enterprise to have to go talk to somebody yeah. to go through a process to get something. And and what I find exciting about Chef is that's what we're trying to do with sysadmin infrastructure mm -hmm. is to remove it take that next step of removing the human element of how do you get it built. You know, and you know, and I, you know, we're kind of in the beginning stages, but I mean, ultimately, yeah. don't you see a position where you have guys? You know, you don't have, we don't have to have ten of you, right? Yeah, you have guys that can basically. And that, I mean, I'm triples. shared across, you know, as architect, I'm shared across multiple projects, and I can sort of help then lead the development team and work with them to understand what we're going to be deploying and make sure the servers we're setting up support that. You know, fully. It, so. anytime uh, guys like you go and pioneer a new area, you learn that there's some things, some new rules, some new patterns. Are, are there some things that people who are following you should should worry about, or should or should re re-educate themselves and forget some old rules and forget and learn some new things? That I mean, I think honestly, like it sounds like a bad term, but becoming a generalist that like in knowing a lot about a lot of things actually helps in this, right? Understanding how the servers work, understanding some of the Linux, understanding the application code running. I mean, you have to sort of like multitask yourself and understand a lot of different things. So, I mean, it sounds like. You know, just learn as much as you can about all the different things and making sure you know your stack, you know your code that's running on there. I mean, why, I think do, in the why past, do you say that? Well, in the past, we were told to specialize. Like, you yeah. know, as I came up, graduated college and came up, which like, learn this one thing, learn it well. But what we've realized is to be successful, you really need to learn your left and your right. You need to understand what's going on, like in this layer over here and that layer. And honestly, the more you can learn about it all, you're going to understand the infrastructure, the code running on it. And I think like that's the most important thing you can do is just make sure you understand you know, how these servers work together, how, the, how you should scale them, make sure you understand the code that's running on. Don't just say, I know Linux and that's it, you know, yeah. and, and, or, well, you know. Yeah, so. and I think the other part of that is we've, you know, I did this presentation called the Cambrian Explosion, you know, that we were at this cloud came, in that we're, we keep raising the abstraction layer, right? So now it's, it's, it's like, even like with the big data things like Hadoop, like we're, we're really close to the point where oceanographers don't have to be these like ridiculously smart rocket scientists, yeah. which is if you just go attack Hadoop. But people have built really nice abstraction layers that we're at the point now where an oceanographer can actually run kind of DSL, domain specific language queries to get their data. Yeah. And, I, and I think I see that across the board. Uh, this kind of abstraction where what we're doing is we're raising the bar. You know, another the great example, Max Media, right, has kind of you know, changed what they can be. And like you started up and say that you shouldn't be doing this, right? You should, yeah. and, and, and it's because these levels of abstraction of companies like Rackspace adding Rack Cloud. It's because of, you know, our open source effort and a lot of other open source tools that have just, I mean, like I can go ahead and start a, a very complex load balanced Ruby stack infrastructure with analytics. And if I do it on my own, I, I just wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah. Right. So. And, and I think that that's the messages that we, and we're just seeing it explode. It's getting more exciting every day. So, very cool. Well, thanks for giving me yeah. a little look into yeah. the world of disruptive cloud-based technologies and go. how it's uh, helping uh, sys ad admins everywhere, right? Well, it's yeah. an honor, actually. I, I've been following Thank you, you so for much. forever. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. thanks for giving me a look around the